Hello and welcome to the 2020 Forge Prize finalist live presentations. My name is Alex Morales of the American Institute of Steel Construction and I will be your moderator for today's event. For the audience joining us remotely, the Forge Prize was established by AISC to support and recognize the work of emerging architects who explore imaginative ways of designing with structural steel. Over the past year, the three finalists that you are about to meet have worked with expert minds in the fields of steel fabrication, design and construction to bring you provocative visions in steel for our buildings of the future. These finalists have also already received $10,000 each as part of being selected during Phase 1 of this competition. And today, they will reveal their improved proposals for a chance to win an additional $10,000 and be recognized as the overall 2020 Forge Prize winner. As a reminder, at the end of these presentations, the audience will have a chance to vote for their favorite design, so we encourage you to participate and support your candidate. And helping us make the final selection for a second runner-up, first runner-up, and the grand prize winner will be our jury of esteemed judges. They will deliberate at the conclusion of today's event and the winner will be announced tomorrow. Before we begin, I'd like to formally recognize the people and the partnerships that have worked with our designers to make this possible. Our jury, Rebecca Gandhi, Gensler. Rebecca Gandhi is a project architect at Gensler. In her 11 years of professional experience, she has served multiple market sectors, including civic, higher education, and science technology. Gandhi co-founded and serves as chair of the Christopher Kelly Leadership Design Program at her local AIA Houston chapter. She has also dedicated time as program chair for Women in Architecture Houston and as mentor for future members of the AEC industry. Gandhi has been featured as a speaker at the Texas Society of Architects Annual Conference. Matt Dumich, Smith Group. Matt Dumich is a principal at Smith Group in Chicago. A dynamic leader and consensus builder, he is known for his collaborative design approach and his ability to execute complex, high-performance projects. His projects now total over 10 million square feet constructed worldwide to date. Dumit served as a 2017 American Institute of Architects Chicago Board President and is the co-founder of Bridge, a leadership program that pairs young architects with FAIA mentors. Dumich also serves on the Board of Trustees for the Chicago Architecture Center. And David Sedinsky, Turner Exhibits. David Sedinsky is Design Director at Turner Exhibits. As a designer with over 25 years of experience, David has held leadership roles at NBBJ in Seattle and was a founding member of Unisystems, a kinetic design firm in Minneapolis. In addition to leading the construction of the Amazon Spheres, he has designed skyscrapers, theaters, and operable roofs for stadiums. With patents in kinetic design and industrial processes, David has led projects for Amazon, Microsoft, the Boeing Company, the Houston Astros, American Airlines, and the Pacific Science Center. Our industry partners. Jennifer Pasden of Casconex, Darren Cook of Steelfab, and Glenn Tabled of STS Steel. We will now have a quick word from our collaborating partners on their experience in working with our designers, beginning with Jennifer Pasden of Casconex. Hi, Jennifer. Hello. 
You can hear me all right? We hear you perfectly. Thank you so Great. much. Um, my name is Jennifer Pazden. I'm the Vice President of Cast Connects, and I'm talking to you from uh, my home office here in New York City. Uh, Cast Connects is the industry leader in the architectural and structural use of cast steel components in the design and construction of building and bridge structures. Um, we are structural engineers who specialize in the design and supply of structural cast steel connections for buildings, bridges, and other structures. By leveraging the free-form capabilities of cast steel manufacturing process, we're able to simplify the design and enhance the performance of structures. So we work directly with architects and engineers in, in the same way that I've sort of been providing some consulting for this forge prize um, to enable designers to use cast steel connections in their projects. And we also work directly with steel fabricators and contractors for our customers and work with our products. Our products include pre-engineers connect connectors that are available off the shelf, and we also offer design build services. I've enjoyed working, uh, supporting the Forge Prize for the second time uh, this year. And uh, Ilgar's design, which you'll see shortly, uh, makes use of Castile nodes to simplify the fabrication and modularize the construction effort in his concept, um, which would save time and project delivery and also save uh, site work. Um, as you'll see, the use of the Castile nodes in his project has also allowed for a very impressive aesthetic um, uh, achievement. I also want to say a special thanks to Tarana Hawk from Casconex for for help in the casting design for Ilgar's uh, design, and also to Martin March from um, Thornton Tomasetti for sharing his expertise in cultural detailing. Wonderful. We have Darren Cook on the line. Okay, we'll move on to Glenn Tabled. Hello, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you fine. Okay. Um, my name is Glenn Table. I'm co-founder and president of STS Steel. We're in Schenectady, New York. We fabricate bridges, buildings, and hydraulic structures. And the projects we've enjoyed most involve finding solutions to challenges created by an architect's innovative use of steel in a unique structure. I'd like to thank AISC for sponsoring the prize, as well as for Alex for all his work bringing us together. I believe this is an investment in innovation and collaboration that will improve our built environment. It was a pleasure working with Matt and Rosanna. I, I enjoyed learning about their personal histories as well as their experiences in other areas of art and craft and how it inspired their design. I like that they're highly innovative, but they also sought out ideas that made the design practical, technically feasible, and faster to fabricate and erect. I, I felt like we were collaborating on a real project and we were considering challenges that needed real solutions. I'm only uh, disappointed that we aren't building this structure. I look forward to seeing all the presentations. I'm sure we'll be hearing more from this talented group of individuals as they continue to find new ways to design with steel. Thanks. Wonderful. On behalf of AISC, we'd love to uh, congratulate and give our thank to our industry partners for collaborating with our designers. Uh, thank you all so much. All right, so I'm having a glitch here. Just bear with me one second. Sorry about that. Now, and finally, our 2020 Forge Prize finalists presenting in this order, Rosanna Harding and Matthew Ostro of Harding Ostro Architects, Daphne Florin Melendez of Lockwood Andrews Newnham, and Ilgar Aziz of SBLM Architects. And now, kicking off the 2020 Forge Prize live presentations, we turn this over to Rosanna Harding and Matthew Ostro. Good luck to all of our finalists. So Rosanna and Matthew, we're gonna turn this over to you now. Uh, if you would begin with the screen share, uh, and good luck to your presentation. Thank you. 
Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you so much to the AISC and to Glenn, who was wonderful. Um, my name is Matt Ostro. I'm Rosanna Harding. And uh, I think we'll just jump right in. Um, so our project is a conversation that um, between a potential link between the new Moynihan station, which is under development, and the High Line. Um, we sought out this problem as we were working adjacently on the shed. Uh, we met while working on the shed, uh, Rosanna and I, and we spent a good amount of time in steel fabrication shops and working through very complex problems and came across many moments when we were uh, at a shop or, or working with steel when we sort of loved the beauty of uh, of the steel without its full uh, coating systems and protection and intumescent and so forth that we need to use on the shed. So we thought, well, let's try to use that, um, that uh, aesthetic and make a connection between the Moynihan station addition and the Highline spur. So our project aims to both elevate the walkway to make a connection, uh, make a connection across the street but also provide a, an additional urban park uh, that has different durations of completely passing through or being able to um, sit and enjoy the weather or lunch uh, during your day. So we decided to uh, make both quick and slow connections. There's also an adjacent uh, bus stop, bus terminal, and some uh, adjacent retail and restaurants, which we thought we would try to elevate this park um, up into the air, create a, a sort of temporary suspended solution, plantings. And as we went through the process, we had an idea about how we were going to really bend steel um, as much as we can and minimize the amount of welding, minimize the amount of connections, and really try to eliminate as much of the site work as possible. We have a little bit of uh, a sort of connection, the short connection, which runs down uh, from our park down to the Highline Spur. And this we wanted to make as minimal as possible. Um, it's not necessarily a highlight of our design, but we enjoyed making the columns. Um, as the shape they were, and these we I plan to maintain, um, would plan to maintain its general aesthetic and bending techniques. This is a view looking down Ninth Avenue, um, sort of a wintry day, I guess. Um, so the, the cantilever spans just touching um, some of the streets instead of avenues, if everybody's familiar with New York City. So this would be a a connection where there's an incredible amount of pedestrian traffic now going um, directly to say the shed and, and over towards um, Hudson Yards. So our original idea maybe closest to the bottom, which is sort of an X, which was to span. We had a few conversations with um, a good friend and, and uh, collaborator, Thornton Tomasetti, and we sketched through some options and came to a uh, a more suspended and leaning and pinned connection, which would be the diagram at the top. Uh, it's sort of a bit of inspiration from um, an actual college travel model. So we did a quick, uh, what we did is decided to take um, this project into a digital project, which I've, we've done in various ways throughout. And so it's just a quick screen cap of the parametrics, which have aided greatly in uh, many projects that we've worked on in order to make actual um, no planar steel, no warping, define every uh, center point, every edge. As we went through, we saw some opportunities, possibly pinning or hinging. Um, what was our theory here? We discussed this with both Glenn and Thor Tomasetti and thought it was too adventurous potentially to achieve uh, at this level. 
So we went with some steel rods, which uh, sort of balance all the pins, similar to the college travel model. Um, the parametrics involved allow this to breathe. And so we have angles that are that are uh, all tied to the rise and runs of stairs and, and the accessibility aspect of the uh, of the ramping of one and 20. So it's just a quick preview of some of the further topics which we'll cover, but um, in the end, uh, all of the steel is completely planar. We went through some of the, uh, the sort of bolted and and various connections allowing for both gravity to utilize gravity, but also to utilize uh, as much shop construction as feasibly possible. So this kind of outlines the, um, the basic uh, components of the project. Um, so in phase two, we really sort of focused on um, the, the structure, particularly at the center, um, and really paying attention to those minimal touchdown points um, as to minimize the amount of site work. So we kind of begin with the um, eight center columns, which uh, then lead into the primary trusses. Um, and the cables that uh, connect those two wings. Um, these are the first sort of sets of ladder components, um, which we'll dive into further momentarily. And then sort of lastly, the, the plates at the center, the stairs, and the kind of final wing at the end. And then of course, the hanging planters and the 30th Street connections. So that kind of gives you a lay of the land. Um, and as Matt mentioned early on, weathering steel was really um, kind of our inspiration to begin with a project and sort of um, use its strengths as um, naturally protective um, and it's real, really its sculptural um, qualities um, and minimal connections, um, with mostly bolted connections. Um, but as a, as a material, um, in, you know, in New York City, there are several examples we could point to, but in particular, um, we, it, it has been used in this climate um, and from our fabricator, this is, or from our collaborator, SD Steel, this is one of their projects called the Tea House. Um, and we sort of found that it is really, a, as it patinas over time, it really um, has this incredible quality and uh, we sort of wanted to really continue and maintain that. So the one thing that uh, through previous uh, investigation, various projects, um, weathering steel, and, and it's debatable in every feasible condition of salt and so forth, uh, its lifespan. But uh, there's two things that we've um, focused on, which was to eliminate any ponding, eliminate any water being trapped or, uh, or sort of caught by um, both condensation, but also the natural weathering outdoor aspects. And the other is to allow the surface to build up uh, its coating. So instead of having a strict paint that you would cover the entire surface with um, and protect the steel that needs to be repainted every so many years, we allow this surface to, uh, to rust. And, and as it rusts and as sort of some of the environment factors start to, to gather on its surface, it creates its own coating. Um, and so there's various waxes and other treatments we could use to seal it in, but we really want to push the boundary uh, of this aspect. So this is a view looking down the middle um, when we were creating benches or seating elements, clearly you don't wanna sit on a weathering steel component. So there's handrails that are all uh, stainless steel and then benches, which we would inlay some wood on. So this is a view of the kind of phase two um, version of the project. So in, in phase one, um, we were focused on this idea of bending the plate steel um, as the sort of the primary structural uh, beam, which then becomes a ladder component. Um, the, the idea with the sort of key concept for this was really primarily about the link between a fabrication technique and an aesthetic, and that the final, the final visible element was in fact the, um, the way that it was made. As we moved into phase two, so this was kind of our um, sort of original phase one cross-section. As we moved into phase two and started our collaboration with Glenn at SDS Steel, 
um, we started to get into the realities of what that really means when you're bending really long stretches of steel. And as you can see in, in the image, the real issue it comes down to is that it sort of limits the thickness of the plate steel um, in order to achieve that um, bending, that, that sort of you know, V section um, and, and the angle as well. So the, the sketch on the left is coming from STS Steel where um, you know, we, we, were, we were very interested in, in um, how do we sort of maintain the V, the overall V shape. Um, and on the left is a proposal for a kind of nose cone. You can see a thinner steel section and a wider steel section. But in the end, we started to think that, that, that these ideas, and there are a few others um, here, was a, um, a sort of a three inch rod to achieve that round bottom edge. And what we started to um, realize is that it, the, it's not so much about the specific act of bending, it's mostly about this idea that the technique is the final visible thing. So we started looking into um, other ways we could potentially um, create these sections. We looked at you know, pre-tensioning or um, flanges and clamping even bending the section on the top end. And as we move through um, in our collaboration, we, we sort of zeroed in on this notion that perhaps there could actually be a gap at the bottom of the beam, which would be held in place by a key fastener. Um, and that fastener is a kind of really unique to the project as a um, sort of clipping solution that would hold that beam and that you would have this amazing moment of, um, of a kind of uh, bottom gap. Um, and since the beam is welded at the intersection of the ladders, you then have this sort of flexibility at the bottom edge to sort of open that edge. Um, and so the drawing on the left is, you know, our, our initial sketch and the drawing on the right is coming from SDS Steel where they're sort of really sort of tuning in what that um, fastener key might be like. Um, and a few other iterations we went through with, with SDS Steel. So ultimately we kind of landed on this, um, uh, a kind of wingtip um, fastener key that, uh, it, would slot into pre-drilled um, slots and then rotate and that rotating action would sort of lock it into place. And through this, we sort of had these conversations with our, um, our contact at Thornton Thomas Eddy and, and we started to think about how these beams are actually sort of performing. And we're kind of making the assumption that, you know, some of the loading is really, um, it, it varies along the bottom edge of that beam. So sometimes it's pulling away, sometimes it's compressing, but that this seems to really kind of be a, a both um, uh, structural and, a, and a, an aesthetic um, idea that could be feasible. We're sort of maintaining the notion of the, slice, the splice plates um, between the ladders as being the, really the best, um, the, the, uh, the best solution to, to get the, um, the speed of erection, but also maintain the, um, the, the aesthetic. Um, so in terms of our phase two development, the center of the bridge, the kind of moment where the public both circulates up through, but also, also the structural hinge point um, is, is really key to our development in this phase. Um, so the drawing here is describing that condition of these primary trusses that are the kind of wings that the, um, the tension cable uh, connects between. So the center, which we found really exciting that this structural idea at the center could be the most sort of um, uh, open space in a way. So where it's doing a lot of the structural work, you use the thinnest elements. Um, so it's kind of an inversion of what you would expect, which kind of makes a, for a very exciting structure. And then of course the um, concrete pile caps and the way that the columns uh, enter the site, those are really the, other than the elevator, there's the only eight touchdown points for the project. Um, and then of course, as Matt mentioned, these, um, the, the different types of connections that we're dealing with. So the center, as I just mentioned, the tension cables are key to tying together those pinned columns. And then the, the key splice plates uh, are the field um, connections as, and then the sort of the shop welding throughout. The so, goal being just a minimal quantity of shoring, um, which we're fully aware, but the, the cranes you know, wouldn't necessarily need to be permanent. They could just be uh, sort of, wheel driven cranes locally brought in and brought out. That's right. So the, um, so that's kind of the primary uh, and those, and structuring. Just the last thing on the ladders, we, we did size them. Uh, you know, we've had some experience trying to get very heavy and long things into New York city, you know, across the GW and in down 10th Avenue. So, um, so our, our design took into account those, those limitations um, with low boy trucks and so forth. 
Right, and then the, the sort of secondary component to this is, are the hanging planters, um, which were the sort of the next bit major challenge in phase two, which is how to really create that shape, which is a square blending into a, um, a sphere. Um, and this was sort of our initial drawing. And the, the ideas that were always stemming from this notion of having a really visible handcrafted element as an opposition to the weathering steel, which is very um, sort of sharp and, and linear. And these elements as being a relief from that, being something soft, something that you can clearly see that the hand, it was made um, by hand. Um, and then, of course, the fact that they are hanging in tension and how do we leverage that uh, structural idea with the fabrication component to this. So we sort of worked through um, several iterations of how we might begin to structure these, these hanging baskets. And we kind of zeroed in on wanting to use a, um, an element that was in, in tension, like the center. So we start to really create a net, but then layering in um, stainless steel as the hammered component that gets placed into that, um, that mold shape. Yeah, and maybe this is where we got a little crazy and, and we're picking Glenn's mind where uh, we were thinking maybe you could make some form of, say, a wood mold, um, maybe similar to the, the, the door handle hammering below, where you could create a wood mold and you can take um, a couple layers of, of screen and then take some layers of, uh, of stainless steel strips and and just sort of ram them all together uh, and hammer them all together without any hard connections. So the hard connections would come in at the frame and sort of create this, this tensioned element that, um, that then you would have a little bit of air for the roots, for the trees and so forth. And so those pieces would, would be made in reusable molds that could then, um, you could start to, the, you know, you can start planting the trees in the, in the shop and then they could be delivered as these units onto the site. Um, and the interface with the V-beams, this piece of it where you, um, the interlacing component is, are these fasteners that are prefabricated onto the V-beams. So then you could sort of quickly bring these on the site and crane them in and sort of drop them in and have slotted connections that they could, um, that could adjust for the tolerance on site and you could just sort of drop those into place. So this is a, a view from the um, Katia model underneath where you see sort of the underside with all of the fasteners um, in place and those kind of upstands. And this contrast of the weathering steel with the stainless steel was sort of very key to us and we wanted to maintain that. So linking with this element are the, at the plaza level um, are these uh, bollard elements. Um, and so these became uh, pr their primary purpose was about um, sort of drainage from the planters above, and you have this sort of visible and, and audible water feature. But also, um, we wanted to kind of make these elements a little more playful and more interactive with the plaza and with the street life. So we started to think about how these bollards not only could be a drainage element, but also a um, leaning bench, um, and how they could also become a light feature. Um, so these bollards end up doing really four functions and we kind of like that idea of efficiency of a single tube of steel that could be sliced and then do sort of all of these things drainage lighting um, back up to the planter so there's a down and an up relationship um, and then a simple leaning bench you know check your phone sort of be a temporary sort of quick pause um, and then of course be a, a safety baller from the street um, as well Yeah, so at the end, um, you know, we see these ladders uh, and the fabrication aspect is essentially uh, a tool of components um, which sits on the site. There's there's an elevator for ADA issues, which helps with our large cantilever and um, that TT assures us will work. And then, but we're pushing it. And then there's, um, there's various elements which could feasibly come in uh, into play, but also be removable and replaceable, um, especially the planters. 
So the kind of um, the final pieces to this are the uh, the perimeter elements and the benches. So we've um, we've sort of taken the challenge to try to incorporate more seating uh, where the users can really interact with this um, object. So we've incorporated benches at at either end of the wings um, and at the center. So at the very ends, we um, these are these kind of bent steel uh, plates that interact with the guardrail, and so we've. Um, sort of transitioned away from a glass guardrail into a, a mesh so that we can have um, the views through um, and uh, create that view back to the to the um, to the park. And of course, the coating on these benches would be would have a wax coating so that it um, there you could physically sit without issues with the weathering steel. Um, and this is kind of the more typical edge guardrail condition. Um, and you get a, a sense of yeah, that. It's also our, our night lighting. So yeah, we're, we're wrapping up here. This is our, sort of our last two slides. So this is the view um, from that plaza space. And finally, um, this is the view back down 30th Street and the kind of experience of the project at night, um, sort of a new iconic public space on 9th Avenue. Thank you. That's the end. That's I think it. uh, it's Jerry comments now. Yeah. Randa, we can open up the comments from the jury, please. Hi, uh, this is Rebecca. First of all, just wanted to say overall, really great concept and uh, beautiful delivery as far as graphics. Um, I did have one quick question. The existing site, um, does nothing currently exist on the site right now? Right. Uh, this is a bit of a response to um, to a problem that's been kicking around various um, various places. But yes, the the site right now it's a funny site where uh, where up on Ninth Avenue uh, and down there's a construction site actually just south of this where they're adding uh, sidewalks specifically for a sort of brutal building. And then uh, there's a there's a desire to so add some protection for this bus station is right now these buses line up. Uh, there's previously a, a lot of construct. This is a, um, an area where they were loading and staging for a lot of bus and yards. So we're essentially widening the sidewalk, which is something that is, um, you know, a common theme in city planning to create wider pedestrian zones. Um, so Ninth Avenue would lose a lane, um, but it would gain this sort of key commuter it element. Loses. It loses yeah. on the next street. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Great. Um, first, I also really appreciate how you use parametrics to really advance the design. Um, it's obvious that it really helped you um, go through the details with Glenn. And uh, I really like the link between the fabrication technique and aesthetics. Thank you. Um, it just it also it just helps make um, this project seem more real and possible. <laughs> like I'm, I'm yeah. thinking, I mean, it's been a while since I've been in New York, but I was like this. Yeah, this it'd be nice if this could happen. And then also, um, let me see. And I appreciate uh, the removal of the glass uh, from your previous uh, submission, phase one submission and changing to the stainless steel mesh. It also helps uh, make it feel a little bit more breathable. Right. A little more open. Yeah, and I think it, it, we were, we, we sort of took that comment um, from the jury and felt we agreed that that there's something really nice about linking in the stainless steel with the planters and the the um, those edge conditions and really kind of allowing the like you said breathing and so you have the vis visible the visual connection um, but you're not behind this pane of glass so that was that was you know a very welcome critique yeah, and just dealing with different trade uh, unions in New York City, trying to keep it in the steel trade was also yeah, <laughs> kind of a, yeah, yeah. Uh, right. added benefit. Uh, those are my comments. Uh, this is Dave. Hey, everyone. Matt Dumich in Chicago. Um, thanks for your presentation. And it's nice to see the evolution of your ideas. Um, one, um, I appreciate that you um, really learned from both our comments as well as um, your collaboration with your with your partner. Um, 
So it's nice to see this second second evolution. Um, real clear logic and story. Um, I appreciated that. Um, very comprehensive design, you know, really from concept through um, following through to the connections. Um, um, my my intern has uh, is bugging me now. So excuse me. <laughs> I got a couple of those. But, um, maybe I better pass it over to David. Actually, <laughs> thanks, thanks Matt. Matt. We appreciate it. Hi, this is David. Can you hear me? Hi, David. Hi, um, guys. Really, really well done. Um, Rosanna Matthew, this is really, really thoughtful. I was so appreciative, and it was fun to review this. Um, and really, thank you for all the really thoughtful, uh, integrated work here. Um, I've got a couple questions, and I'm, I'm going to preemptively ask one just to make sure that my, my bigger question is on point here. It was this view that we're looking at at the moment. The ballers, which I really love, they're for catching the water from the planter. Is that fair? That's correct? That's right. Okay. The beans, though, so then here's the bigger question. So the core 10, I'm a huge fan of core 10, raw steel, you know, you don't have to convince me that this is the right way to go. Um, you wanted to push the bounds of weathered steel, which I really like. Um, I'm not sure how, how you did it though. Like I'm still seeing really aggressive drip edges um, and it's the controlling of, of, of abuse of water. Um, like on this ground plane, like I can't help but imagine that I'm going to see this perfect grid of condensation and drip um, of the ladders onto the ground. Or is that in the intention or am I, what, what's your thoughts there? Um, yeah, I mean, we, we didn't focus on the ground design for that particular reason. There's two, two topics here. There'd be water, water from the side and then there'd be the potential sort of driving rain aspect at the edges. Um, we create some overhangs and so forth, and we're, we're trying to get all the, the, the water um, from the top to filter through. I mean, Cort uh, Cortan or Weathering Steel, the, the minor bit of rust, once this builds up its proper coating, would get filtered through the dirt and, you know, potentially even add to the sort of soil mixture. Um, has no harmful aspects to anything green. And then in terms of the ground, um, it, it's been a common... Um, concept to sort of control the water but in the end i we were pretty interested and rosanna was pretty interested in trying to make the ground actually be a bit of a receptor for that so yes we right so the um the ground plane you can sort of see it is pretty subtle in the image but we've we've kind of created these corresponding um uh sort of uh divots in the ground plane that mm -hmm. correspond with the beam line above but something to clarify is that the top of this bridge is completely sealed from the underside. In other words, there's no rain sort of going through or between the gaps of the planters and the steel. So the, the kind of, um, as Matt said, it's really the driving rain from the side that you would anticipate, which is less of a dripping from the core tent itself. But in the, in the, in the condition that there is dripping, which would you know, it'd be sort of more by where the stairs are because everything is sloping. So you imagine the coalescing and then the kind of converging towards the center. Um, so we've tried to incorporate some uh, grooves into the concrete, just like you would, you know, a concrete joint that would um, control cracking. That was kind of the goal is that if there is buildup um, of drainage, you, you might get discoloration in prescribed, uh, you know, etches or traces. Right, okay. Um, and my other question, comment, exploration sort of thing is that I'm, I'm a sucker for steel connections and you, you put all this thought into all these great connections, but then you bury them and the world never gets to see them again. Uh, you said something during your presentation about you want to explore quick and slow connections. And I, can, can you talk about sort of those two things? Like, what does that mean? And like, and the choice to put thought into connections, but then not express them or to put them as part of the, uh, the design. Right. Well, so one thing I would say is that there's there's kind of a hierarchy of connections. So in terms of connections we want to express, the main connection is the bottom of these beams, as you see in this image, which um, is really about challenging the notion of, you know, a beam flange. And it's all it's really kind of inverting the paradigm on its head. So that was our primary goal was the sort of the underside of this V as being 
um, the main connection we, we uh, wanted to express, the splice plates really, those are the ones which I assume those are the ones you're referring to when you say they're hidden. Um, those occur in really, um, a, as you can see in this image, a, a sort of a key dividing sort of zipper down the project, down the middle and then one of the larger wings. So in terms of expressing those, we were less interested in and though that was sort of more about, those are the, the quickest, as we'd say, the quickest connections um, on site, right? Uh, and, and that it's really more about the fact that this, the, the ladder is a kind of prefabricated element um, and expressing those, those connections. Now the center, as if you to zoom out in the hierarchy, the center connection of the two wings coming together, um, that is, we felt, in a way that connection is the biggest expression that we have as the, the voided space in the center of a cable truss. Um, no, she said it great. I, I think, yeah, I, we've, you know, full disclosure, tried some pretty heroic connections in previous projects. And, um, and yes, uh, I don't think we tried to hide any here necessarily, but I think some of them, and, and again, we could go on for, a year um, having some more experiments but in theory this is something that required a sort of minimal um, site shoring and sort of site impact which was also one of our goals in terms of the concept of fast and quick it wasn't strictly you know the sort of how many times you need to to do the automatic welder it was more um, it was more the sort of erection concept well i gotta commend you i think this is a really thoughtful well well envisioned, well executed, well detailed uh, craft. Uh, the one, uh, uh, one thing I would encourage you, um, as as you're looking at these varieties of scale and technique and assembly pieces, um, the smaller handcrafted that it's you know something a little bit more intimate where the user is touching something that's a little bit, um, you know, besides the just a stainless handrail. I would encourage you to kind of look at something a little bit more, sort of like the pedestals. Frankly, the the, the streetscape um, ballers. Um, begin to get on that. Um, doing something. Ten to... minutes Q and A Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. We really uh, appreciate your feedback. Okay. Now we're going to turn it over to our next presenter, Daphne Florin of Lockwood Andrews Newnham. Daphne, if you would please share your, your screen. And ensure that your volume is on, please. Uh, unmute button. Okay, great. I can see your screen. So it looks like um, you're good to go. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, audio is on. Okay. Uh, my name is Daphne Floran Melendez, and a project architect with uh, Lockwood, Andrews and & Newnham. And I have been working uh, for more than 15 years now. And um, mainly, I have been doing mainly uh, government and corporate facilities, including higher education, schools, corporate interiors, mid-rise residential, and performing art facilities. The project that we are about to see now I'm presenting is uh, is originally a, pro a project that I did at my masters uh, during my masters in a uh, FAMU, Tallahassee, Florida, and these uh, sketches that are the ones that I sent first when when I was submitting for the for the first prize. Uh, they are showing this um, multi-purpose complex and invested. You couldn't see uh, hidden underneath the sketch of the unit what uh, the site actually looks like. So in basic, we were assigned to design uh, a project for this area that was a suburban uh, abandoned parking lot and a shopping center. And our group came up with the idea of doing a pedestrian facility instead of, you know, instead of uh, giving the car the main reason to be in there, we, we said the people were the actual reason that we were having these units. So each person has a, an idea and we were to explore the courtyard uh, scheme. 
So each student has a to design a, a multi multi housing unit, which is the what you are about to see. It's a, a more detailed uh, rendition of this uh, multi-purpose of housing, multi-family housing unit. When I started the project, I was thinking about doing these modules, and um, they were about 20 by 30. And um, speaking to Darren, uh, he was saying that probably the modules were a little bit too large to be transported because uh, the whole idea was to manufacture this uh, framing and then bring it outside. So we uh, we thought about in basically splitting the unit and uh, made some connections. So you will see that probably there's a double columns and and then kind of bolt them together and bolt, bolt the connections together. So in basic, you will transport half of the, of the frame to make that unit. Uh, maximum will be 14 feet uh, for a truck to not to be able to be escorted. So these units are now 10 on the split. So it's about 20 feet total. Then that they are 30, 30 feet long, so which is pretty easy to transport and then kind of put it together on side. Um, the next slide is showing uh, the same idea of this module. And you know, each housing unit will have probably more than one module. Because so, so the module is about 600 square feet. So that would be like a, a really small studio. So it is understood that each, each unit will have at least two modules. And this particular one, uh, the, the interest in the design is to express the, the steel material. So that's why these particular units, they are not hiding any, any, any of the steel. And actually, we wanna, I wanna actually port, uh, express all the connections and express all the steel so that's why you had this very clear uh, curtain wall uh, hand, uh, connecting directly into the steel and then showing uh, and showing behind it the actual frame. Uh, we, of course, we need units that are more private because the other one is a little bit too exposed. So we had uh, for the private areas of the house, we would have units that had solid faces and in this case, the uh, actual skin will come behind the frame. So it, the, the steel will be expressed at all times, even, even uh, sometimes it's just behind glass and you can see it through. And sometimes it's just really exposed to the outside uh, to be able to see it. This is a section of the schematic model, uh, SketchUp model that kind of shows how the units kind of be put together and more or less the spacing. And the whole idea of the project is to somehow start these units freely as they come. And also the units themselves are structural. So it's not like unlimited. They're they are oversized. The members, the steel members are oversized in, on purpose so they can do, uh, they can span uh, this courtyard, they can be put in whatever way we need to, to see fit and be able to uh, create different spaces. Because in reality, all this giant cube is exploring the space and the ability to keep filling in more units or just, uh, or just having these uh, courtyard areas and terraces that people can come out and, and have an extra uh, living space in the unit and then looking, looking into the interior courtyard. So this is a view of the interior courtyard, how, how the, you know, the residents will be able to interact with each other and then all this platform kind of play into the space. And these volumes fly through as a, as a bridge because that's really the inspiration of the, of the actual concept is this bridge, the bridge uh, structural uh, concept. Um, at the corners, of course, we will have uh, uh, 
circumvertular circulation units. So they will be more solid. These are not really uh, part of the, the, the housing units themselves. So they will have service area at the four corners for elevators, the stairs, and uh, mechanical systems and all of that. So the units can be serviced. So this is a good view that can show you how the curtain wall uh, can enhance freely in, in front of the steel structure and you can see through uh, a discretion of the material. And as well, this is a, another good picture that you can see a, a closer look of that. Uh, seen through that unit and look into it and see the steel. So another question that actually uh, Darren brought up uh, during, during the, our meetings is like how, how we uh, fireproof the steel well, in basic, we could uh, we could uh, fireproof by uh, adding an uh, intumescent coating, and uh, and also the the top coat could be a finish, and the top coat comes in any any single uh, any single uh, color that we could have, and even metallic. So we yes, we will be able to expose the steel and fireproof it with this intumescent paint, and then top coat it with a actual finish. And it, it will be uh, also the finish on top will be also uh, resistant to corrosion. So it will be fireproof and protected for corrosion as well. In the interior, uh, uh, I chose to put wood as finishes to warm up a little bit the, the steel. And this is a view of from uh, inside one of the units looking to the courtyard. Another view uh, inside the unit as well. And, and this is about the, the whole presentation. The whole idea is just to actually expose the steel every time, every opportunity we have and uh, make it look beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Daphne. So we uh, technically have five minutes or we're, we're ahead five minutes on this presentation, but we will go ahead and open it up to commentary from the jury. Uh, Daphne, thanks so much for your presentation. We'll turn it over now to our jury. Hi, this is Rebecca. And then just a warning, if you hear a crying baby, my one-year-old is having a fit. So I apologize for that in advance. Um, Daphne, thank, um, I'd like to, I'm happy to see the progression of the submission with the additional renderings um, and the introduction beforehand as far as the project was nice. Um, I do have a couple of questions. I was hoping uh, to see a little bit more detail on, um, since this is a people would be uh, multifamily housing, people would be living here kind of wanted to see your ideas on the exterior envelope and insulation. Um, just how, since people will be living here and they're going to have to, um, any ideas or any, do, would you like to describe a little bit of that? Well, we can, we can finish all the units with uh, insulated metal panels and an insulated metal panels also for the roof. Uh, there's no reason not to, not to have all the materials and, um, Having having the insulation properly, and the glass the glass uh, could be could be uh, energy efficient as well. Uh, actually, they made a, a clear glass that is is highly uh, efficient. Um, right now, what you see is just a conceptual model, but of course, uh, those planes that you see they will have some thickness and will provide the the necessary insulation. And about the framing, the you know, the, 
the connection with the framing and all of that, uh, we can also provide continuous on the inside too. So it's, it's not like it could not be done. Yeah. I really like the idea of modularity um, and just having a kit of parts. I am curious to see maybe if you were to progress this a little bit more on how these pieces, modular pieces connect, even if it's a simple diagram, a floor plan, just to get an idea of the interior cir and vertical circulation uh, that uh, the individuals would, would have to get to their units. I mean, would it be uh, one housing unit that spans across the top or is it a narrow bunch of studios? I'm just, these are just some of the questions that I have. And if you were to progress this a little bit more, might be helpful in just describing um, the kit of parts and how you can really uh, use it in different ways. So the units at the top, that will be like two penthouses, like two units at the, at the top. And then it has a private areas at the end. That's what I'm envisioning because of, I don't have really corridors, so all the units will need to be entered from the from the vertical vertical circulation area. So I'm not for, I'm not envisioning having a corridor looking at outside. So pretty much, uh, yeah, the the top units will be penthouses, so they will be a little bit bigger than the other ones, and there are only like three units, so that's not really a uh, very big uh, space. Uh, about 2,000 square feet plus the, you know, if you look at the corners, you will see the, the enclosed area for a service. So, you know, and it's not, not really big at all. Uh, and the other units, they could be, they could be assets uh, from the, from the, from the corner vertical uh, circulation. So that it won't be a major problem just to make them work as their ambition. Great. Thank you. Great, Matt, David, do you have any comments? I, this is David, I'm gonna jump in here really quickly. Um, I, I wanna uh, echo Rebecca's comment here that this has really gone tremendously uh, beyond where the first time we saw this. And so I appreciate the fact that you really uh, started teasing out the, um, some of the thoughts here. Um, your basic module, 10 by 14 of, I, again, I'm a huge fan of modular design. Um, I, I, so I wanna see the exploration of how do you, like how did you arrive at that as a as a module um relative to sh to overland shipping sizes and how do these modules plug together like what how do you see these pieces like is it all pre-manufactured and then how are they plugged together like where are the services and the plumbing and the electrical and the thermal envelope and the steel splices and like how how do you can you talk a little bit about that okay um Right now, the, the units are not showing any any ceilings, and I uh, I can see that. But the 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 unit itself is 14 feet high with the framing and everything. That's plenty of space to provide a, a plenum that we could either hide with a, a cloud, or we can let the you know the borders of the unit, the corners of the unit, be freely. So it really doesn't need to be uh, uh, limited. The exterior phase, uh, the, the, this, there's thing that we could do to hide the, the mechanical and the, there's plenty, plenty, it's almost five feet space. So residential is only nine feet high. Uh, so that, that could be easily work out. And uh, the units themselves, uh, the, the, the width that a maximum uh, trailer truck could uh, legally go on is uh, eight foot six. And, uh, they allow to uh, to go in Texas. They allow it to go to 14, 14 feet wide, like overhanging from the both side of the truck. And uh, I actually thought that that was a little bit too dangerous. And uh, the maximum lane will be twelve feet, uh, the, the lane for for each uh, each car or vehicle. So we I thought that you know having uh, trying to make the units a little bit uh, larger than the the eight foot six model that will fit actually like a shipping container. I was thinking probably uh, 10 will be a reasonable uh, amount of width to be able to transport it. And the, the length is also like the, once the, the unit is put together, it's 30 feet. So your average truck will be 48. 
and they, they come in 60 feet length. So actually you could, you could transport two of the models uh, in the same way that they're going to be put together at the side. You can just, you know, kind of uh, oh, so put them to it. Yeah. Are well, they shipped they're, on their side? So they're shipped on their side? What is it? So are they shipped on their side? That 14 feet, I'm trying to figure out which way's up. If it's 14 yeah. feet tall, how do you ship it on its side? Yes, we, you could you could put it on a flatbed truck and 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 bring that in into the side. So the the, the okay. maximum height the maximum height for a uh, for a low it will be uh, 14 feet six. Actually, they are uh, they are lower than what is allowed already. So okay. everything that you 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 had a flatbed and then you will put them in and of course you have to wrap them up and make I sure see. that they are they're uh, how you call it uh, attached. For, uh, properly to the flat bed and two uh -huh. of them can go in one. Okay. Um, and really uh, my last question, could you talk about that? You showed us a site plan at the very beginning slide. Can, that was very organic and sinuous and, and had soft edges, but the design has these really orthogonal hard shapes to it. Uh, can you talk about how the two go together? How, how does the, the module and the site plan uh, interact. Well, the site plan uh, was more a group design, and uh, we were thinking about doing a free form uh, in a way. Uh, but really, the, you know, the unit themselves they were not really limited by by you know the shape of the the actual uh, organic. Uh, side that it was like the the complex itself so i um uh either way it could it could worry the way because uh, really the 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 bring uh, the bringing of the organic is really this uh the cold jar experience so you're bringing the nature in instead of you know having it in a shape or form so i i didn't think that it was a a contradiction actually it was a proper way to do it. Uh, you had you had a very expressive site, uh, pedestrian site, very organic, and then you had uh, these units that are kind of more into uh, bringing the nature themselves into the into the, the interior of the of the facade. So I I thought I always like to play with uh, uh, you know different uh, items that are they seem to be contradictory. So it's it's not really something that I, I don't, I haven't done before. Okay, all right. Well, I'm gonna leave it at that. Thank you very much, I appreciate it. This, I think it's a very thoughtfully, uh, thoughtful presentation. All right, thank you. Thanks, Hi, Dan. Dan. It, it, it's Matt. Um, thanks for your presentation. Um, and uh, it, uh, I'll echo my colleagues um, with, with appreciation um, to see the development of your scheme. Um, I know that Rebecca mentioned this. Um, I do think it would be helpful um, to have a floor plan or a site plan just to understand the context in a little bit more depth. Um, one thing I was wondering, and I, I didn't, um, I may have missed this. Did you, were you partnered with an industry collaborator? Um, did you get some feedback from, uh, um, from a fabricator? Yes, uh, it's a diet and cook uh, with steel fat. Uh, some of the details that you saw over there, he uh, he provided those sketches as uh, suggestions on how to get it done. Okay, got got it. I think so. I think you showed a sketch that showed how the modules could be um, connected together. Um, I was just curious, um, just your thoughts on what you learned from that collaboration. Well, I, I learned that I I had to uh, I had to work very hard to get it to get it split. So that's that's the first the first thing I learned how to uh, how to think about forward about the actual uh, modules being transported and the limitations that you have. So it's not like uh, you could do every any width possible and any height possible. So you are constrained to this uh, this uh, smaller. Uh, spaces that probably, you know, it's not that uh, practical for uh, designers 
So I I learned a lot on that conversation on how to how to actually uh, get the units smaller and and, and tamed down to be transported and uh, be manufactured. Okay. And um, on the frames themselves, I, I would have liked to have seen a little bit more detail about how the members um, are connected within the module. Um, for example, are those bolted connections or welded connections? And is there a gusset plate um, between the um, vertical, horizontal, and diagonal members? Well, uh what Darren was suggesting was bolted connections, and uh, pretty much I would I would think that they could be easily bolted together because welding welding is a little bit more uh, extreme. But I I would think that probably the main frame, uh, you know, surrounding it is more than, than likely to be uh, welded. So that depends on how a structural engineer will will look at it too. Uh, Great. So that was our uh, one minute cue. Now, if you'd like to add anything else, uh, Daphne, um, I do have some questions myself, but I think we'll reserve those to the end. Um, just in the interest of time, uh, thanks, Daphne, so much for your presentation. If you would now, please stop sharing, and we will migrate to our next presentation uh, by Ilgar Aziz. Uh, hello, everyone. Okay. Hi, Edgar, you sound perfect, so your audio is on. Um, if you would please screen share, I see your screen now. So, um, whenever you're ready, we are ready for you. Thank you so much and good luck. Okay, yes, I'm ready. Thank you very much, Alex. So, hello everyone, uh, I'm Edgar Aziz. Uh, I have been practicing architecture since 2010. And currently I'm working at uh, SPLM Architects and uh, I'm very passionate about architecture and engineering, and I really enjoy designing. I hope uh, you're also going to enjoy some of my works. And I'd like to thank uh, to Jennifer and Tarana from Cast Connects, and also Marcin March for his valuable feedbacks. And um, okay, uh, let's start. Okay, it's a Twix systems I prepared. So twigs systems are inspired by natural structure found uh, in twigs of the birch tree, legs of the blackboard, and head of the uh, guinean and coke of the rock. So by mimicking the joints or, in other words, knots that are already available in nature, I propose the steel system that addresses both design and construction challenges like aesthetics, uh, resilience, and practicality and speed. So. Uh, for the aesthetic of the Twix system, uh, I was inspired by the head of the Cock of the Rock, as you see here. Uh, first time I saw uh, it in a documentary, I was fascinated by its beauty and elegance. So that's the, where the story started for the structure of the Twix system. So I was inspired by the actual tree. I also was inspired by actual tree twig and how it holds itself. So here's the... Um, after the frust uh, frustrating trial and error, uh, I end up with this unique form. Uh, this element could be used as a structural column, facade system, bridge mast, uh, canopy structure, uh, art installation, and etc. I believe that's a very functional and aesthetic alternative to the traditional column. So, so basically, uh, what I offer is taking a traditional and conventional column. Uh, cutting two swords from the top, uh, separating the top cuts, uh, and then cutting again from the uh, bottom, uh, separating again. And finally, uh, squeezing the ends. As a result, I achieve appealing, uh, uh, appealing design, uh, which I uh, which also perfectly functional as an element to bear the loads. So here, uh, after further uh, refinement, I achieved this tweak element. There's a uh, axonometric view, uh, side views, front views, which are the identical, depends from where you watch it, uh, and also top view. So the tweak element uh, could be scaled uh, to various sizes according to the requirement of the project. Uh, I will present some of my sizes that 
are used, but it could be used in unlimited ways, really. So there are a couple of uh, available options to fabricate twig element. Uh, depending on the size and weight of the element, it could be either completely fabricated by welding uh, four identical parts uh, at, the, at shop and shipped as one component to the site, or it could be assembled at, uh, at the field by connecting eight prefabricated parts, as you see here, um, uh, with the other system. Uh, top two parts uh, and top uh, bottom parts are identical, and four uh, middle parts are identical together. And here you see Diablo system, and here it's a separate uh, forms. So the, it's a fabrication concept uh, provided by uh, Cast Connects. Uh, first is a fully fabricated form of the twig uh, system, and over here we see uh, pre-welded, and that one is the uh, one unique part uh, of the four. Uh, uh, four identical parts. And here the cut through of this part. And I get excited when I see this image. Uh, first and uh, grand design proposal using the twig system is a curtain wall system and uh, structural columns. So building, uh, the proposed location of the building is in Manhattan, New York, uh, between 6th Avenue and 35th Street. Uh, so, and the, uh, so there's an existing high-rise building that I'm proposing extended sort of fit toward the main street and redesign its facade with three curtain wall system. Uh, also, I propose to support the extension part of the building with three columns. So here you see a final design. Uh, it's not yet built. <laughs> okay, so now uh, here is a uh, here you see a twig in a large scale as a column on the left. Um, uh, to, at the left, the column to hold the load of the extended part. And second image is a render of the twig cort, uh, curtain wall by climbing at a, and wrapping the glass as ivy. So uh, here you see dramatic renders uh, of the facade view from the street level looking up. This gray area is a uh, this gray area is an existing um, building, and the rest is a sort of fit extension to the building, as you see from here. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, in the extended part, I propose double height floor, double height floor by only extending every other floor. That way, more daylight could be brought deeper in the building. And also the double uh, floor creates a very spacious area for the users to enjoy, rest, and socialize. Here you, see, you also see the section, um, how the glazing is vivid between the twig system, which challenge the conventional way of layering the facade. The twig system is not just the exterior layer of the facade, but also an interior feature, inviting the users of a building to uh, interact with it. So uh, here you can see my thinking process from the sketch to render. As I mentioned in the uh, beginning, uh, one of the inspiration for the twig element was the actual tree twig. And you see how the facade elements are kind of growing from each other as twig does from the branch. So the network of the, this facade elements creates strong structure to hold uh, and support the glazing. And the facade uh, ends <clears throat> individual sculpture parts, uh, which are the representation of the life and the hope. It's really exciting. <laughs> now, uh, now enough uh, of the poetry. Uh, let's talk about how we are going to make this vision uh, really happen. So a single twig element is in the height of uh, two floors uh, <clears throat> and is repeated for the rest of the building height. And the sweet type of the uh, connections that holds the system together are repeated throughout the whole facade. So that's that's why I'm going to talk about details only at fourth floor of the building. The rest is identical to the uh, that four floors. Uh, even though the facade looks complicated from first impression, so it's uh, it's only assembled from three shape of the glass panels. The highest glass is 17 foot and four inch, and which is seven foot nine inches. 
And uh, this is that, uh, so this is that uh, two structural twig, which holds a new extension of the building. Uh, here is it, the front and side elevations, an isometric view. The detail shows the well-being part of the column. As I uh, mentioned uh, before, this column consists of the four identical parts. So this is the starting point of the twig facade system. Uh, as you see here, the facade system bottom connects to the slab. You could see from this detail as well, with uh, base plates. <clears throat> and then uh, this detail shows the connection uh, of the twig parts with Diablo system. This connection is repeated throughout the whole facade, as you see in the green places. And uh, here's a uh, from side view and from elevation front view. So, okay, so that's the interesting part. So this detail is sh uh, shown how glass uh, cuts through the twig element. So you, you see here, over here, and also you could see it uh, in that part. And then. Uh, so the exterior part of the twig element is removable. So that part is removable. Uh, I, you know, I'll learn to take the glass out and replace it if needed. It creates thermal break between interior and uh, exterior. The transition between two uh, twigs, uh, which happens through, uh, through slip joints, uh, along extension, you, you see over here, along uh, uh, extension and com uh, compression between twig elements. To create a uh, fire separation, I'm proposing Hilter, uh, Hilter <coughs> fire barrier to ca uh, cavities between floors. This is a section detail view of slip joint connecting two twigs over here, you see. And top and bottom twig connect with the brakes, uh, sorry, brackets to the slab separately, which are uh, a loss movement between twigs. This detail is repeated every uh, four floors. So uh, I'm proposing uh, to address thermal bridging challenge with uh, a shock type CSC. You could see it here. Uh, it reduces heat loss at uh, exposed, exposed concrete slab edges. You could also see it over here in the section. So in the same detail, you see the one interior side over here of the twig element sitting on a slab while the exterior uh, side of it connecting the next twig through Diablo connections. So you could see it over here as well. So now you, you see uh, renders uh, of the interior of the facade system. So, so, let me, so from now on, uh, in the next few pages, I will talk about the twig can be used in completely different ways. One of my favorite users of twig, twig is a mast for the bridges. So I worked uh, on the facade system in more depth and detail. Next section, I'm going to uh, present a more conceptually how to use different applications. So uh, I start to study with a simple sketch to see how twig could be used as mast in a bridge. This was a starting point, and I was thinking to design pedestrian bridge and place it at one of the highways. <clears throat> However, uh, the idea is developed from the conventional pedestrian walkway into more ambitious and interactive form that could be an integral part of urban landscape in the beloved uh, neighborhood of uh, New York. The proposed site for the concept is again in New York. Here I propose three-way overpass, as you see, uh, Battery Park, Hudson River Greenway, and Financial District. So, uh, and finally, I ended up with this concept where I'm proposing to connect Bowling Green Park to Battery Park uh, uh, through the overpass. It's one of the uh, uh, densest area in the New York City due to popularity of the bit of it between New Yorkers and tourists. Uh, I observe myself most of the time, there is a crowded traffic of people uh, from Broadway uh, coming down from Charging Bull, Bull uh, to Battery Park. Or as it connects these two uh, popular destinations could make the flow smoother. The proposed site for the concept is again in New York. 
sitting near a bowling park uh, and charging bull. So here it is. So, so what's the difference in this concept is that twig is placed on three legs instead of two legs. So you see the one leg, two, and third leg in the down. Uh, by doing that, I can achieve more stable structure and the fourth leg is playing the role of playing a pylon that supports full weight of the deck. Deck is connected to a pylon with cable state system. Deck 17 feet above the ground and its length is 420 feet and width is eight feet. So that length allows to address the ADA requirements adequately. Uh, height of the pylon is 80 feet. In this design concept of the twig, it's not just structural element, but also a public art piece to be adored. So now you, you see uh, the uh, top and side view of the twig uh, for the overpass. And uh, here one of the uh, assembly, the twig in the field. Because it's a large scale, it could be assembled and welded uh, from two different forms, four identical end parts and four identical middle parts. So here are some renders. Uh, final renders. So you could see. And this one. So, so now, okay, one more, please. Uh, so I also designed a canopy by using a, a twig system. So design product, which is uh, beach umbrellas that are supported with smaller and thinner version of the twigs. So you could see this amazing view. And how twig used over here and shape. So <clears throat> uh, it's a, me a mechanical adjustable umbrella that gives control of the shades to the users. Uh, twig, here, twig here function as the main supporting system. So you could see here I show the uh, skeleton of umbrella and how it could be fabricated. And uh, because it, it's a small scale user of twig, it could be packed and shipped to the user and be assembled in the side. And here is the isometric views. Here are the side and front elevation of the umbrella. And as I mentioned, the uh, uh, degree of the shade could be controlled, as you see over here, by the user. So, and uh, this is an exposed isometric, uh, isometric drawing of the series of the umbrella joined together. Uh, twigs are connected to the narrow shade long tubes with adjustable con connector that allows to change the degree of umbrella. So here are some renders. Got um, four minutes. Okay, I'm almost done. <laughs> so that's at the end. It's a Twig art installation. The so Twig can be adored as a public art installation because it's a dynamic and sculptural form. And there's no limitation on how to use a Twig in constructing environment. Really, the only limitation is the imagination. Thank you, everyone. I'm done. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much, Edgar. We really appreciate you participating this year. Um, now we will turn it over to the judges. Uh, let's begin again with Rebecca Gandhi. Hi. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I really love the elegant and sculptural approach that you brought uh, to the curtain wall. Um, I know you spent more time with that, so I, I, I do appreciate that and seeing the different uh, how you really put a lot of thought in the different pieces and how they come together. Um, I was a little surprised that you actually didn't show one of the original renderings. I believe it was a colonnade or um, like a- Oh, yeah, yes. Yeah. So actually, you know, instead of doing that, uh, so the purpose of this uh, render was to show Twig system could handle, you know, one floor, uh, building. So over here, let me show you. Okay, that's good. So the reason why I didn't show it, it's only because I'm showing here how it holds uh, itself. One minute. Okay. It's okay, 
I hope I'm going to find it. Sorry. So over here, uh, I show it, you know, how it could support itself. And if we are going to use it as a one floor uh, building, we could use just those eight pieces, which is a uh, two identical piece. So that's why just the reason I didn't show it. Okay. Um, I am also a little curious on with, um, I believe it was Jennifer that you worked with, if you guys were able to look at any um, analysis on uh, the sizing and how much weight it could take. Actually, um, no. Okay. okay, and I'm also really um, thankful that you brought a lot of thought into the thermal uh, thermal barrier, thermal break between the curtain wall. So it's really nice to see that level of detail. Yes, I talked to you know, the engineers uh, about that part, so that's why I paid attention to it. In okay. And then part of it is also walking us through really your relationship with this twig <laughs> shape, this form and how it can be used with um, different approaches. That was Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, David, are you in your mind? Uh, I'm gonna jump in. Uh, oh God, this is really nice. I, I thought the, the notion of, of challenging the column as a conventional straight shape was a very bold, risky, daring, uh, challenge to take on, and I really commend you for uh, taking on such a big item. Um, the two things that jumped out at me, I was wondering if you, could, if you could tease out a little bit. One of them was, right, that's beautiful, that image right there. Um, let's talk about constructability. How do you see the glass, the, I see these giant glass shapes. Um, how are they being assembled into this? Like, what's the order of operation? Like, you know, put yourself in like the, the builder's shoe, like a, a piece of steel, a piece of glass, a piece of steel, a piece of glass, a deck of concrete. Uh, like talk about how you put the pieces together. Okay, sure. So as you see, um, um, so spider uh, glass system supports uh, glass. Mm -hmm. And then when it goes up glass, uh, as you see over here, it's really a glass over there is a fillet uh, supported by uh, spider glass system. But when it goes up, as you see over here, mm -hmm. so, those uh, purple uh, part is removable. So as I mentioned over here, you see, those are removable. So it, they play as a roll co cover roll. So if let's say if something happened, those covers comes out and this glass system could, uh, could be removed easily. So the, the glass is not, so the glass is out of plane then? Is the glass vertical so, or following the column? So glass support, uh, so over, as you see over here, mm -hmm. so supported by, by spider system and also, I mean, one glass system supports, let's say, spider glass system, but another mm -hmm. one uh, freely by the uh, twig system. So as you see in this detail, that mm -hmm. supported freely with the uh, twig system. The spider system doesn't support those glass. So that's why um, under the each uh, glass, there's a shelf, so it holds glass, so it doesn't go down, you know, doesn't fall okay. down. Mm -hmm. and, okay. yeah. so, uh, yeah. and my other question was on the bridge. Um, uh, can you talk a little bit about just uh, like the resolute, part? yeah, that's great, the resolution of forces, because uh, we know greatest moments at the fixed end on a cantilever, and so the, the shape should, I would expect to inherently get wider at the fixed end and tapered at the points. Um, help, uh, did you give any thoughts to that or, or how the resolution of forces and the, the, this, this really sculptural shape being force derived? Um, uh, uh, actually, no, I didn't go that far. It's most like, uh, mostly, you know, conceptual. Okay. Develop in the future, definitely. Okay. That's all I have. Thank you very much. This was really, really right. fun to review. It was fun to explore. Thank you very much. And the, and the subway, hands down, that should have been your opening shot. Subway is the is your best. That that was really, really a strong image. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, David. Yeah. Um, Matt. 
Hi, Elgar. Thanks for your presentation. I, I agree. I, I love the subway <laughs> shot. Um, and I think that it's really interesting to see um, this obsession, um, exploration of these twig ideas and how it can be deployed in a whole variety of scales. Um, and I appreciated that you gave us a little more detail on a building facade type of application, um, um, which was really kind of fascinating because in addition to kind of breaking the column from, um, you know, uh, verticality, you're also creating this really rich depth um, that, that's a, a really interesting place. So that, that up view um, to see the twigs going in and out and the interplay um, between structure and enclosure is really quite a fascinating study. Um, so thanks, thanks for that. Um, did you, we, and, and also I, I will commend you um, for a lot of additional resolutions since the first time that we saw this. Um, it's a lot more clear um, as you walk through the presentation how um, some of the um, connections are intended to be made. Um, how did you arrive at the scale? Um, it, it was deceiving originally um, to look at this, um, to see the scale, because you basically have, is it quadruple height spaces with a slab in between? That in, On this view, I see, you know, an expressed slab at the bottom. Yeah, th this is a help. The section is, is, I think, a little more helpful to see. Um, so there's kind of three different conditions. There's a infill condition which your cursor is on there's a, um, a bypassing condition in the middle and then the building structure actually has another slab further further back inboard right um, I'm just wondering yeah how you ended up on the dimensions and considerations for shipping um, these elements oh well, this oh uh, so uh, one twig element is 28 floor high and it's uh, and it consists of three parts, which is uh, so over here. One moment, please. So base part, the bloom, and middle, and then top part. So they are uh, about uh, so bottom part is ten feet high. Uh, middle part is a uh, eight, and top part also is a uh, ten. So basically, you know bottom and the top, they are identical to each other, and middle four is identical to each other. So they are all together, let's say 10 foot. I mean, if you put uh, one twig uh, element together, it's uh, 10 foot wide, and let's say a couple of feet wide, uh, 10 foot uh, long and a couple of feet wide. You know, if you put in a, let's say in a, uh, in a truck or, so if it's, let's say, if height is uh, changes, scale is changes, so it could be uh, manufactured in a, a shop or it could be brought uh, to the field as a separate part and welded together in the field. So, yeah. um, okay. Yes. Well, thank you. I enjoyed seeing you. Did um, I answer your second, question? Second uh, sorry. Uh, so, did I answer your question or? You did. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, uh, great. Um, Ilgar, this is Alex with AISC. I do have a question for you. So, my question really was relating in terms of. Um, sort of a, tr trying to find a happy medium of scale um, in the proposed site. Obviously, this is a conceptual design competition, but um, in your proposal, um, what sort of challenges were you addressing when you were thinking about um, how these would be delivered to the job site and also the uh, sort of the scale of them as they relate to um, kind of the human scale, that, that aspect of that, those relationships. Would you please elaborate a little bit on how that process looked like on your end? So, uh, so basically, you know, when I uh, started to uh, design it, you know, I think, you know, it, height was 20 feet. 
uh, for the one floor. So I start to see, you know, how could I keep its uh, thin view? And also, uh, I also uh, address the uh, height to the floor ratio. So there are a couple of available options uh, to fabricate tweak element, uh, depending on the size and weight of the element. It could be either completed uh, fabricated by welding for identical parts and uh, at, the, at the shop and shipped as a one company to the site. Or it could be assembled at the field by connecting, so I, as I did in uh, on the PIX system, facade system, so connecting eight uh, prefabricated parts with Diablo system. Uh, top two parts and bottom two parts are identical. So it really is coming across as the system itself being a modular composition to allow for, I would assume, um, uh, more uh, flexibility in transporting these units to a job site. So uh, great, I can appreciate that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, wonderful, Igor, this will end this portion of the presentation. If you would please uh, stop sharing your screen. Um, we will uh, sort of have finishing commentary um, on behalf of AISC, we'd like to congratulate and thank our participating partners, uh, all of our fabricators, and in the case of uh, Jennifer Pasden, um, her expertise in castings. Uh, we'd like, also like to give a big giant thanks to our jury, Rebecca Gandhi, David Sedinsky, and Matt Dumich for guiding this along and giving our designers some feedback. And finally, of course, we'd love to thank our designers, Ilgar Aziz, Daphne Florin, Rosanna Harding, and Matthew Ostro for your visions in steel for the 2020 Forge Prize Conceptual Design Competition. Um, at, this, at this point, we will open uh, uh, the audience for polling. So uh, let me backtrack that a little bit. We will open the polling for the audience. So if you would please look at the bottom portion of your YouTube screen, you should see a link there for um, the uh, polling that will come in. So while we do that, as that's gonna be open for about three minutes, um, uh, Zach Garber with AISC will share those, uh, those results and we, we'll all be able to see them here on the screen. Zach, if you would please share those results as they start coming in. Um, as that happens, I'd like to open up the floor to a bit more commentary from um, our jury. Uh, anything that you'd like to add to the conversation um, from uh, the three finalists uh, for today's competition? Uh, commentary. This, this is David. Um, no, I want to thank you, Alex. This, this was a fun to get to see the evolution of all these projects, and I really appreciate the fact that we got this, this, these uh, uh, submissions all went through sort of a second round and, and a reinvestigation. And you know, we we gave uh, gave notes, and they seem to be really thoughtfully um, digested and and distilled, and you know, uh, and really uh, got to see a second round and just to see the pro the progress was uh, was uh, encouraging and exciting. So. Thank you to everyone for uh, uh, doing that second round of effort. I know how hard it is to work on these competitions uh, to the side and to submit it, and then have to do it again uh, is is cumbersome and and, uh, and difficult. And so, thank you for doing that. Thank you all so much. Any additional comments? Well, great. Um, we will. Uh, hold on just about one more minute and then we'll close the polling. Uh, we encourage all of the audience to visit www.theforgeprize.com tomorrow to learn about the decision that will be made by our jury on the second runner-up, first runner-up and the grand prize 2020 Forge Prize winner. With that said, we'll uh, go ahead and, and uh, now close polling. Uh, if we could close polling, th these are about the results that we're probably going to get in about uh, the three minute mark that we had. So um, we will dismiss our three designers and we thank you all of our audience who joined us remotely for viewing the awesomeness, design and inspiration 
brought to us by the three phenomenal Forge Prize finalists for the 2020 Forge Prize Design Competition. Um, 